The son of Martin Cortez and Catalina Pizarro Altamirano, Hernan Cortez was born in Medellin in 1485. During his youth, he studied in Salamanca for two years, where he obtained an education in law that was to prove very useful to him throughout his life. Without completing his studies, he returned to the family home for a short time. He soon left the comfort and familiarity of his home environment to make the journey to the new world. In the Caribbean, he asserted his skills and observed how men, eager for fame and fortune, could make their way, while increasing their estates and waiting for the right moment. A man of prestige, Cortés drew the attention of Diego Velázquez, government of Cuba, who entrusted him with an expedition that aimed to recover from the setback suffered by Francisco Hernández de Cordoba and Juan de Grijalva. About 550 soldiers left Cuba, including 32 crossbowmen and 13 riflemen. 200 indigenous Indians and some African slaves also joined the army, along with a number of service Indians. 10 bronze cannons, 4 falconers and 16 horses travelled on board the ships. In that contingent, a significant number of participants had been brought together from the two previous expeditions. These were disgruntled men who, on the beaches of Vera Cruz, gave Cortes the support to found a lobby and send King Charles V documents and jewels. The rupture with Cuba had been consummated. Next, they set out to begin the incursion into the empire, dominated by Moctezuma II, whose emissaries made contact with the Bearded Ones almost immediately. On the coast came the first encounter, the Battle of Centla, in which some believed to see Santiago the Apostle fighting on the Christian side. In the same battle, Cortes had most of his fleet swept away and dismantled to prevent the faction that wanted to return to Cuba from doing so. Over time, the flames that complete the mythical image of Cortes burning his ships were added to that legend. From the coast, the Spaniards penetrated and began to establish alliances with the Tenochtitlan tribes. The first of these was made with the Sempuala. However, the decisive one was the one that was sealed with the greatest enemies of the Mexica, the Tlaxcaltecs, who were the main allies of the Spaniards during the conquest. Meanwhile, Moctezuma alternated offerings. He was desperately trying to dissuade those men with their war strategies from entering his city. In the holy city of Cholula, the emperor had planned to take down the Spaniards. Cortes, seeing the signs of a possible ambush, advanced and instigated a bloodbath among the Choluteca nobility. The shock of that massacre paved the way for the Castilians, who crossed between volcanoes and headed to the capital of the empire where they were greeted lavishly. The lake town of Tenochtitlan had a deep impression on them. It was as beautiful as it was dangerous because the island, within a lake connected by roads interrupted by drawbridges, allowed its visitors to be completely cut off. Fearful of this, the Spaniards kidnapped Moctezuma, who had already attacked the Europeans in their rear guard. For months, Cortes and Moctezuma lived inside the Axayacatatl Palace. However, that calm was broken with the arrival on the coast of Velasquez's men, led by Panfilo de Naves. The arriving Spaniards soon established packs with Moctezuma, who still retained much of their power. It was necessary to neutralize those Spaniards who threatened what had been achieved up until that point. So Cortes left the city with Pedro de Alvarado holding the fort. Victory easily fell on the side of the Spaniard, who used all his cunning to overcome Naves. With many of his soldiers incorporated into his own troop, Cortes did not have time to celebrate his victory, for back in the capital, Alvarado, fearing an attack, had massacred the Mexica nobility. From then on, Calm abandoned the Spaniards, who were locked down in their palace. It didn't help getting Moctezuma out on the roof to placate his subjects. The emperor who had lost his power was struck down by a stone. With the death of Moctezuma, Cortes arranged for his flight from the city, which went down in history as the Nocta Trista. During the night, much of the Spanish army and the Tlaxcaltec allies died on the sides of the Tacuba Road at the hands of the Mexica. Beaten by that setback, the Spaniards were nevertheless able to win the Battle of Otumba and return to Tlaxcala, where they were well received. Also working in the Europeans' favour, an epidemic for which locals had no natural defence began to spread. 
the Tlaxcala, Cortes designed an amphibious attack. He ordered the production of brigantines to sail through the lagoon in support of the infantry and cavalry. Here's how it was done. Under the orders of Martin Lopez, the wood was cut and the pieces were made that, after being taken to the shores of Lake Texacoco on the shoulders of the Indians, were assembled into the ships needed for the battle. The final offensives on the Tenochtitlan combined the action on the roads with the support of those boats for which the native canoes were no match. Gradually, the Spanish army, augmented by a growing number of allies, was locking up the Mexica Braves, who were still able to do a lot of damage before their surrender. Eventually, the lack of supply and the new diseases factored heavily on their surrender. On the 13th of August 1521, after more than two months of siege in which the city was razed, the last emperor, Cuauhtémoc, was imprisoned while trying to flee aboard a canoe. 